Bisco Presbyterian Church in Bisco, North Carolina. If you're joining us, we welcome you and invite you to participate with us wherever you might be. I pray you have uh, your spirit ready, and in a minute we will have a prelude that will help us to do that, and then worship with us. Get your Bible. Hopefully you can uh, have a pencil and paper to take notes. We want you to participate in this time of worship. Just a few announcements that I want to bring to your attention. It's been a while since we have been able uh, to do this other than by text or email, but we do want to congratulate our high school graduates, uh, Lily Patterson and Bray Woodard. That seems like a long time ago now. Summer's almost over, but we do want to honor and recognize them. They have been given their Bibles, but we miss that time in our church family when we can recognize them, but we haven't forgotten them. And Lily will be leaving this Saturday for college, so remember her in your prayers. Remember her family. Uh, they may need the prayers more than she does. I think she's excited, and I remember those days. And then don't forget to pray for one another, minister to one another, make that phone call, send that text or email, drop that card in the mail. Let people in the body know you're thinking about them that they're not forgotten. Uh, most of our people are very good at self-isolating, but that means you are isolated pretty much. And as a church family, we want to stay in touch with one another. And then don't forget, expenses continue. And uh, that's just part of life and part of life in the church. And so uh, be sure you're being faithful in your giving. If you're concerned about that, just pray and ask the Lord what you should do and how much you should give. But we do have expenses that continue, some unexpected expenses that come up, just like at your house. So be sure and give, but more than that, pray. Pray that the Lord will provide. He always does. He's provided generously for us, and we thank him. We have gathered to worship. That's why we have come, and we are blessed that we can use this medium uh, to at least uh, by live streaming be together. So I would ask you now to turn your thoughts away from those things that would distract you. Think on the Lord Jesus and let's worship him together. Hear the words of the psalmist. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this time that we can gather, albeit quite differently than what we're used to, but thank you that we can come together around your throne. And wherever we are, there you are, for your spirit resides in us and you promise to be with us. 
Lord, we pray that you would move in and through us to draw us to yourself, to open our hearts to your word, to spur our hearts that we would worship and magnify your name. Lord, thank you for those who've given of their time and expertise and talents to make this happen. Thank you for Mark and Jonathan and their technological knowledge and skill that can help us do this. Thank you for Erin and her willingness to play and use her talent and skills to glorify you and to bless us. Lord, we do love you because you first loved us and you sent your son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sin. We didn't know what love was till you redeemed us. We did not know what it was to live until you gave us a new life, a new birth. And so we come to praise you, to lift up your name, to exalt you, to revere you, for you alone are God. You indeed are our Redeemer and our King. And we thank you that we can worship you, that we can be in your presence, and we look forward to the day when we will gather around your throne. No empty places, no missing people, all the sons and daughters of the great king at home, praising his name. Until then, Holy Spirit of God, move in us that we would do that very thing. Worship and glorify our God, our Savior, our Redeemer, our King. And teach us to pray. As Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we want to do an Old Testament reading, and I would ask you to open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10, the prophet Jeremiah is speaking to the Lord's people, and as we read, you'll see that the Lord himself is speaking, and he is using his prophet to convey his words to his people. Jeremiah chapter 10, God confronts his people about the foolishness and worthlessness of idols. Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 1, hear the word of God. Hear what the Lord says to you, people of Israel. This is what the Lord says. Do not learn the ways of the nations or be terrified by signs in the heavens, though the nations are terrified by them. For the practices of the peoples are worthless. They cut a tree out of the forest and a craftsman shapes it with his chisel. They adorn it with silver and gold. They fasten it with hammer and nails so it will not totter. Like a scarecrow in a cucumber field, their idols cannot speak. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them. They can do no harm, nor can they do any good. No one is like you, Lord. You are great, and your name is mighty in power. Who should not fear you, King of the nations? That is your due. Among all the wise leaders of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. They are all senseless and foolish. They are taught by worthless wooden idols. Hammered silver is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphaz. What the craftsmen and goldsmith have made is then dressed in blue and purple, all made by skilled workers. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God, the eternal King. When he is angry, the earth trembles. The nations cannot endure his wrath. Tell them this. These gods who did not make the heavens and the earth will perish from the earth and from under the heavens. But God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. 
When he thunders, the waters and the heavens roar. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. Everyone is senseless and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is shamed by his idols. The images he makes are a fraud. They have no breath in them. They are worthless, the objects of mockery. When their judgment comes, they will perish. But he who is the portion of Jacob is not like these, for he is the maker of all things, including Israel, the people of his inheritance. The Lord Almighty is his name. May we search our hearts lest we find that we are worshiping idols, idols we've created to make ourselves comfortable, but not the true God, the living God, who is able to save our souls, who is able to redeem us completely. At this time, we'll have a prayer of confession. It's imperative that we as believers keep short accounts with sin. And while that's true of us individually, it's also true of us collectively as the church of the Lord Jesus. So let's pray together. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all people, we acknowledge with shame the sins we have committed by thought, word, and deed against your divine majesty provoking most justly your wrath and indignation against us. We earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for all our misdoings. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive all that is past and grant that from this time forward we may serve and please you in newness of life. To the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our assurance of pardon comes from Psalm 32 and verse 5, where the psalmist writes, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. The psalmist uses his experience to encourage the people of God. He said, this is what I did. I did not cover up my sin. I did not deny it. I did not try to explain it away, but I confessed it. And you forgave my sin. First and foremost, we sin against God. And so it's to him we should go first and seek forgiveness. Then if we have sinned against others, go and seek their forgiveness. The assurance is that when we come in humility and faith, when we come believing him, trusting him, he does indeed forgive. The psalmist says, you forgave my sin. And there's not a Christian who doesn't know the blessed truth of being forgiven. Thanks be unto God that he is the God who forgives sin. Amen. Let's affirm our faith this morning using the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. These things Christians have declared, these truths Christians have believed from the beginning. We simply are affirming that we believe what the apostles taught, what the Bible teaches, 
what the church has proclaimed. We stand in that line. We stand on the truth of God's word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can gather around your throne. Come as your children, those redeemed by your grace. Those who've knelt at the foot of the cross and cried for mercy and found there a fountain flowing rich with soul-cleansing blood. Thank you that that cross is ever empty for the sacrifice is paid and applied and Jesus has come forth victorious from the tomb, sits at your right hand ever interceding for us. So even now, Lord Jesus, our high priest, pray for us. Holy Spirit of God, move in us so that we will know how to pray even if it's just the groanings and achings of our heart. Lord, we long to know you, truly know you. And the more we know you, the more we realize how little we perceive of you, for you are so great, so awesome, so glorious, so magnificent. We catch but a glimpse at best of who you are. And we are overwhelmed. Continue to teach us of yourself. Draw us to yourself. We long to be where you are. 
We long to know you and experience you. Thank you that the sure hope of heaven is that we will experience you and do that forever, exploring and discovering the wonders of who you are and what you do. Lord, keep us faithful. Give us grace and strength to be faithful in these different and difficult days. Remind us that you're still on your throne and you're not wringing your hands. Your plan is being accomplished. And you've not asked us to understand what you're doing or to give our approval. You've asked us simply to walk by faith and trust you and be lights that shine in the darkness, to be winsome witnesses, standing for your truth, living lives that are consistent and faithful to your word. Holy Spirit of God, we can't do that unless you do it in us, unless you give us power and grace. And Lord, remind us that we're broken vessels. It's not that we're better than other people, is that you have redeemed us and made us new. So we pray. We pray that you would work in and through us to use us to touch the lives of others, to point them to Jesus Christ, who saves completely those who come to him. Lord, as a church family, we come and we pray for those who need a special touch of your grace and mercy, a touch of your healing, a touch of your presence. We pray for Ashlyn and pray that she'll continue to feel better and better and get relief. Lord, we pray for Mike that he would just be completely healed and be able to be home soon. Lord, I know there are others who struggle with being isolated so much. May your presence encourage them. Send them. Uh, however you would do that, send them by various ways, messages of encouragement reminding them that you haven't forgotten them and that you're there. Lord, we pray for our church family as a whole. Folks, get worried that things will fall apart. Remind us that you're the one who holds us together. That our unity, our oneness, the tie that binds is you yourself. And Lord, when we think on that, we relax and we rejoice for you are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. And Lord, in these days, we do miss the fellowship of the saints. The time of corporate worship when your church gathers in your name at the place set aside for worship. We miss that time with each other. We miss that time with you. Lord, I miss coming to the communion table. I miss the sacraments. Lord, in this desert wilderness experience, would you continue to nurture us? Teach us things we could not learn any other way. And may we not be like Israel of old who grumbled and complained. But may we see your good hand and ever praise you and trust you. Even when you ask us to do that which is totally impossible for us. May we walk by faith and not by sight, ever trusting you, the only God, the true God, the living God. We pray for those who are serving in difficult places. Think of the missionary pastor who was gunned down just a week or so ago in Haiti. Who'd spent 20 years or better there ministering to people brutally poor people warring against dark forces the evil one did not want him there and yet there were many who came to Christ many who were fed many who were clothed as you use this faithful servant now he's gone raise up 
ten in his place. We pray for those in Lebanon who suffered this week from this horrible explosion. And we would especially pray for our brothers and sisters who live there. Lord, we pray that they would be able to shine and have opportunity to show and share Jesus Christ and his life-changing gospel to the people around them. Lord, we pray for lost souls, those who are close to us that we know and pray for regularly, and those that we see as we pass who are lost. Lost with no hope for eternity. Don't even know they're lost a lot of times, but they are. And Lord, we pray that your gospel would change hearts and lives as your spirit breathes on us. Send revival to your church. Renew us. And send revival in our land that people would be changed. People would be saved. And that you would be honored in our midst. But Lord, most of all, work in our hearts so that we see you as our great reward. Our delight is in you above everything else. And if you never gave us another good thing, if revival doesn't come, if the worst thing we can imagine happens, we will still be praising you and delighting in you. We want to be like Paul and Silas. When those dark times come and we're in that inner part of the jail, at midnight when others would be cursing or crying, they were praising. Oh, do that in us. Do that in us. That in these days that feel dark to us, we would not be moaning and complaining, but we would be praying and praising and singing and delighting in you. For nothing in heaven above or in hell below can separate us from your love for us in Christ Jesus. Oh, make these truths real to us and speak to us as your word is preached. Give us open and receptive hearts. Draw us to Jesus, who is mighty to save. And we make our prayer in his name. Amen. If you'll open your Bibles to John chapter 6, you remember lo, many months ago, we were in the middle of John chapter 6, and literally we are in the middle of Jesus' bread of life discourse. Jesus has declared to this crowd who has followed him that he is the bread of life. And you remember that he fed them miraculously, these thousands of people. Later he walks on waters, he teaches his disciples and shows them exactly who he is once again, demonstrating that he is the Christ of God. The crowds follow him. And he declares that he is the bread of life sent from heaven. Now the crowds followed him because they liked what they saw so far. And it's in the midst of this discourse that we pick up the text for this morning. Verse 41, John chapter 6, this is the word of God. At this the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said... I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. And Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. 
Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat, and not am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And this bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus is addressing the crowds that had followed him. They were moved. They were impressed. They really did believe that finally this long-awaited Messiah had come and Jesus was him. Nobody had done the things he had done. He taught with authority. He healed the sick. Why, he even fed them, a multitude. And they were filled and there were leftovers. They followed him. This is the Messiah that we can, we can get behind. We can support him. Why, he's the one who can throw off the scourge of our Roman conquerors. He's the one who can restore us to political and material glory. He's the one who can feed us every day. He can provide for us so that we will be the head and not the tail. Our bellies will be full. We will be prosperous. That's what they thought. But Jesus' discourse dispelled that myth. He was not talking about coming as a conquering king. He rather said, I'm the bread of life who's come to you from heaven. He was speaking to them of eternal life and spiritual things. He talked about believing in him, which meant following him as the will of God. And at this point, many took a giant step backwards and began to think about what they knew. The truth is that saving faith believes God's Son and God's Word even when we cannot fully comprehend all that is being declared. As an eight-year-old boy, when I knelt beside the living room couch and prayed and asked Jesus to come in and forgive my sins and save my life, I did not understand very much about the gospel or biblical truth. But I told my mom yesterday, I said, Mama, one thing I know. Jesus is the Christ of God. He died to save sinners, and he has saved me, and I've never wavered from that. That I may not be much, but he is. And I trust in him. That's what Jesus is declaring. He said, you don't have to exhaust all the theological realities because you won't. The more you learn of God, the more you realize you don't know. The more you see of sin, the more broken you are. The more you see how heinous it is. The more you see how desperately you need such a Savior and you have such a Savior in Jesus Christ. But this crowd, instead of believing Jesus, began to grumble. And so we pick up the narrative at verse 41. And I am reminded of the children of Israel in the wilderness. And Jesus is alluding to that when he talks about manna. And we'll see that in a little while. But if you need some reference points to go back and look it up later, Exodus 15, 24, Exodus 17, 3, Numbers 14, 2. The people grumble. Every time things don't go the way they want them to go, they grumble. Years and years and years have passed, but their descendants are just like them. They're still grumbling. So in verses 41 and 42, we see the people grumble and doubt. Jesus did not immediately give them another meal. He did not immediately feed them, say, oh, you've gathered here and there's a big crowd of you and I'm so glad you all came and yeah, the rah-rah, getting the crowd all primed for what's coming. They were, they were ready for that. They were ready for Jesus to say, my disciples will be passing out. And the menu today is. That's not what they got. That's not what they heard. 
They thought Jesus was going to feed them just like they had received manna in the wilderness. And when he didn't, when it was obvious he had no intention of feeding them, but he was speaking to their hearts and minds about spiritual truths, they began to doubt. They began to doubt who he truly was because, after all, they knew him. Or thought they did. I want you to notice before we move ahead that their unmet expectations immediately caused them to doubt. Uh, their unmet expectations caused a negative response. I hate to tell on myself this way, but yesterday we were going to have a little snack for lunch and I had my mind primed for what was in the drawer and that's what I wanted. That would be perfect lunch. And guess what? It wasn't there. It was gone. It had been eaten. I just was all out of sorts. And I didn't eat lunch. I know, go ahead, it didn't hurt me any, you're right, it didn't. I didn't think about it in that context till now, but I was just like these people. My unmet expectation caused a negative response. I just, my mouth was all ready for, like you go to your favorite restaurant to order your favorite dish, oh, I'm sorry we're out of that tonight. Just sold the last serving. And what happens? Well, I drove all the way here for just for that. I come every Saturday night just for that. If we're not careful, we too can be like that. Their unmet expectations caused them to doubt. They were not seeking God's way. They were seeking their own way. And when they didn't get their way, when things were not panning out, playing out the way they thought they would, they began to grumble. Jesus points them to the fact that physical food lasts only a little while. you got to keep eating to keep living. But what I'm talking to you is about food that lasts forever, a food that will sustain you unto eternal life. But instead of listening to Jesus, they look to themselves. And I want you to notice their logic. These people are incredibly logical. And in the West, we have traditionally been logical people. We look to science and math and technology and engineering. And even in our arts, we, we look as to see that well, we're, we're built on you know, sound reasoning. And we explore our feelings and the world around us from our ability to see and understand. We have great confidence in our own ability to think and reason. That's what they do. And notice how they think, since we know Jesus' father Joseph and his mother Mary, then, if then, you remember those little scenarios when you were in Philosophy 101, since then, his claim that he came from God, for he said, I came down from heaven, must be false. I would say their logic is impeccable. Their conclusion was absolutely erroneous. He defied their logic. He superseded their logic. And woe be unto us if we look to ourselves as the final authority on everything in this world. That's why God revealed himself in his word and in his son. He is the final authority. Jesus is declaring to these people the way to life eternal. But they can't get past the idea that Messiah will be who we think he's going to be. He will do what we think he's going to do. And if you're not going to do that, then you can't be the Messiah. And after all, we can validate that with our own logic. We know your mom and daddy. So how can you claim to be something special from God? And Jesus responds in verses 43 through 51, and we see his response to the crowd. First, he tells them, stop grumbling. You see that? Stop grumbling. Stop whining. Uh, it 
if you ever taught school, and sometimes the children think you're going to do one thing, and they've been telling you, we're going to do this, we know you're going to do this, we want it this Friday, and we know we're going to skip the last period, and instead of doing math problems, we're going to get to go out and play. And they've been talking it, but you haven't told them you're going to do that. In fact, you've told them, no, that's not going to happen. But the group think has taken over, and they think, and so at 2.30 before the bell rings, take out your math books. Oh, you would have thought you had given them all a dose of the black plague. And they were going to start writhing and dying in the next two minutes. Whine, whine, oh, you said we were, no, I didn't say that. That's what these people are doing. They're grumbling, they're complaining, and Jesus says, stop grumbling. And if we could read between the lines, he's saying, look beyond yourselves. Broaden your horizons just a bit. Ultimately, verses 44 and 45, salvation is of God. He restates what he has already said in verse 37. A sinner cannot come to Christ unless God draws him or her. The dead cannot respond. Those dead in trespasses and sin cannot respond unless the Spirit of God quickens them. But Jesus says, I am the Savior and I save completely those God has given to me, those the Father has given to me, I will raise them up at the last day. This isn't a salvation that's just a meal or a day or a month or a year or a lifetime. It is eternal life. And he reaffirms his point in verse 45 by referring to Isaiah 54, 13 where God through the prophet says that he will teach his people. He will instruct them in the truth and they will know the truth. I read a sermon yesterday by Charles Spurgeon and he made a point that God is the one who redeems us. God is the one who calls us. We can't come unless he calls us. And he says, and don't sit there and think, well, I'm not of the elect, so it's okay. I can't do anything about it. He says, no, you are responsible when you hear the truth and you feel the pull on your heart. You realize your sin and your helplessness in your sin. Then you cry out to Christ. He said, we don't understand the electing purposes of God, but we know when our hearts are broken within us and we long to be saved. We know that's the work of God. You respond. So Jesus is telling them, I know that it takes God to work in your heart. But they weren't looking to God. They were looking to themselves. The answers they could provide, the dreams they had dreamed, and Jesus was not about to fulfill them, and they were not happy. Verses 46 and 47, Jesus reaffirms that salvation comes only through Christ the Son. In verse 46, nobody has seen God. So how is he revealed? Who has been in his presence so that they can come and declare what he says, what he's like, what he demands? There's only one who fits that bill, and that's Jesus Christ. Go back and read John 1, 18. The only exception is that Jesus has seen the Father, been with the Father, knows the Father, and he reveals the Father to us. Nobody else has been there. Nobody else has seen God. Nobody else has been in his presence. You see verse 47, the one who believes the Son sent from the Father has eternal life. And if you go back and read this whole passage, what you'll see is that harkens back to verses 29 and 40. Jesus is basically saying the same thing again. And one of the things in methodology when I was doing Christian ed, the professor said, you're going to have to learn to repeat yourself creatively. And I don't know a teacher that doesn't know you have to repeat the same things because we learn by hearing the same truths. And so what do we do? We say it. We write it. We have them say it. We have them write it. We do all these different exercises to what? To reinforce the truth we're trying to teach. Jesus is doing the same thing. He's not saying something different. 
He's saying the same thing he's been saying to them. Jesus is consistent. He is the one who has come from the Father. He is the one who has the message of life eternal. You go back and see John 1, 12. You see what Jesus says to Nicodemus in John 3, verses 14 and 15. And again in verse 16 and verse 36 of chapter 3. And then in chapter 5, 24. Jesus is faithfully declaring that he is the Christ of God who brings salvation. Nicodemus, you must be born again to the woman at the well on the living water. To these crowds of people, I'm the bread of life. Later on, we'll see, he says, I'm the light of the world. He says, I'm the good shepherd. And then you notice in verses 48 through 51, he again makes that statement, I am the bread of life, restating what he's already declared in verse 35. And in verses 49 and 50, he contrasts himself, he, the living bread, with the manna of their ancestors in the wilderness. They were fed with manna in the wilderness during that 40-year period of wandering. Uh, in my personal devotions, I just started Joshua a couple days ago. And it was interesting that just one little notation in there in the beginning of Joshua, I forget which chapter, it says they, you know, they went in the land, they began to conquer, but they ate the produce of the land and the manna stopped. From then on, they would eat what the land produced and then what they would grow after they conquered the land. Jesus says, you think about that manna. It was there every day. God faithfully provided, but those people still died. They died in the wilderness. And when they went into the promised land, the manna ended. There was no more manna. He says, I'm talking to you about living bread, which brings life eternal. This is the bread that comes from heaven that brings eternal life. He's talking about salvation through himself. And you'll notice verse 51, his declaration. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. He is saying what he's been saying so they can hear it one more time. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. You see that? Whoever. I'm sure if they had thought beyond their own disillusionment, somebody would have said, are you serious about this, whoever? This isn't just Jews? Nope. You mean those filthy dog Samaritans? Yep. Those heinous demonic pagan Gentiles, you mean they can have eternal life? Yep. Anyone. And some of the more righteous Jews would have said, you mean women? Because the Pharisees prayed every day, I thank thee God that I am a Jew and not a Gentile, a man and not a woman. Anyone. Anyone, notice what Jesus says, anyone, whoever eats this bread will live forever. And what is this bread? It is me. It's my flesh which I give for the life of the world. What's he saying? He says, the living bread is me. I am the sacrifice. There was bread on the table of showbread in the temple before the Ark of the Covenant. It stayed there all the time. Every week it was exchanged. Twelve loaves representing the twelve tribes. Always the bread of presence was there. They knew what he was talking about. They knew he was talking about something much more than just bread and meat. Although at Passover they ate bread and meat. At their festivals they ate bread and meat. Symbolizing God's forgiveness, God's bounty, God's redemption. Jesus says, the bread is me. I give myself. I give my life. That's what provides redemption. And just as that physical bread has to be eaten to sustain life, so you have to partake of Jesus. You have to believe. You have to follow him. 
You have to experience the reality of relationship with him, the new birth that he talked to Nicodemus about. If there is to be this eternal spiritual life, you have to partake of Jesus. I'd like to tell you that they stopped grumbling and arguing, but resorting to their own logic, many in the crowd concluded that Jesus could not possibly be the Messiah. Why, well, after all, they knew Joseph, whom they wrongly assumed to be his physical father. And the more snide of them would say, oh yeah, we know his dad. Wink, wink. You know, Mary was pregnant before they got married. And then there's Mary, why we know Mary. Wink, wink. And they never considered she to be a virgin mother. But their logic was wrong. And so today, many look to themselves and their own logic and their own reasoning, their themselves as the final authority. Well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so, so I don't need Jesus like they do. I've heard a person say, well, if so-and-so gets into heaven, I'm a shoe-in. But the old song says, it's me. It's me, O oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. It's me who needs to be forgiven. It's me who stands alone before God, condemned in my sins, who needs a Savior. And you see, as people filter the truths of the gospel, the truths of the scripture through their own logic, their own sinful, faulty logic, they too begin to grumble. And yet the truth is, hasn't changed. Peter, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Now what about you? Are you partaking of the bread of life? Has your life been changed because of Jesus Christ? Are you feeding on the living bread? Do you have life eternal because you know Jesus Christ and you follow him? Or do you have all these reasons just like these people why this possibly couldn't be true? May God help us not to worship the idols we have created or follow our own logic, but to listen to the Spirit of God and follow Christ. O oh, thou bread of life, feed us ever. Nurture our souls, strengthen us, give us grace that we might be stronger today than we were yesterday, for you alone are our Savior, our Sustainer, our Redeemer. Lord Jesus, we have no other plan. It's you and you alone. And you are enough. Your grace is more than sufficient. May we leave behind the things of our own logic and leaning. And may we heed the word of God and come to the cross and find life. May we who know you feed on your word. The word written, the word preached, the word taught, the word shown us in the sacraments. May we feed and be nurtured and strengthened. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
receive the benediction. And now to Jesus Christ who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen and amen.